this platform to use. So much. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, as Misty suggested, we'd like to welcome you to the meeting today. We're very excited um, to be here and to engage with you around this learning today. Um, my name is Mickey Ray, and I am the director of the Division of Program Standards. And we just want to thank you so much for your time and for your willingness to continue investing in the standards implementation process. Um, specifically, I want to thank Amy Razor and the Northern Kentucky Cooperative for partnering with us just to host this regional event today. And at this time, we'll just jump right in and I'd love for my fellow KDE colleagues to introduce themselves, please. Hi everyone, I'm Misty Higgins. I'm a professional learning coordinator in the Division of Program Standards. And my name is Carrie McDaniel. I am also a professional learning coordinator in the Division of Program Standards. Good morning, I'm Jan Sellers. I'm MTSS Coordinator in the Division of Program Standards. Good morning, everybody. I'm Thomas Klaus. I'm the Education Academic Program Manager uh, for the Division of Program Standards. Thank you all so much. And I just want to add that today you are going to be receiving many resources and we certainly don't intend to overwhelm you. Um, we just want to ask you to think about where you are right now and what steps you would like to take in some systemic processes that we'll be discussing. Um, and at this time, I'll turn it over to Carrie to do a little bit of housekeeping for us. Thank you, Mickey. So just as a reminder, you can access all of the readings and materials needed for today in the March leadership folder that Thomas shared with you via email. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to print those materials off ahead of time, but if not, just know that those are readily, readily available to you in that March leadership Google folder. And Thomas has placed the link to that resource as well. Um, he will be placing links to all the resources you will need throughout our time together today. So be sure to check your chat box for those links. And you may want to bookmark any websites that are shared just for reference later. Throughout our session, you will have opportunities to engage in breakout room discussions with colleagues from across the state. So you may want to have your phone handy to take a picture of any slides you want to reference while in those breakout rooms. If as we move throughout our time together, you have technical issues, as Mickey shared, please reach out to Thomas Klaus via private message in the chat and he will help troubleshoot those issues with you. Also, just as a courtesy to others, we would ask that you mute your microphones while you're not speaking to help minimize the amount of background noise Zoom is set, so when you return from a breakout session, you will be muted, so you will need to unmute to share out. Cameras are welcome. We love to see your smiling faces, but if you need to turn your camera off to protect bandwidth and stay connected, we completely understand. However, we would encourage you to enable your cameras while in your small breakout rooms if possible. And then finally, because we wanted to be mindful of your time today and not waste a single second, we do have a full three hour session planned. So while we don't have scheduled breaks built in, we encourage you to use the two feet rule and step away if you need to, to grab a drink or take a restroom break as needed throughout our time together. And so we know that as we move throughout our time today, you may have questions for us. To ensure we address all of your questions, feel free to post those in the chat or you can add them to the Google Doc in your March leadership folder titled Parking Lot. We will be monitoring questions in the chat and address those at the end of each section when possible. If your question requires a more in-depth response, we will add your question to the parking lot document for a deeper follow-up explanation via email. Throughout our session today, we are going to be putting you into breakout rooms to give you an opportunity to process the information being presented, as well as to have professional dialogue with other colleagues. Because you are going to be in a breakout room with the same people each time, we wanna start this morning with giving you a chance to meet those people. So in just a minute, <clears throat> When we go to your breakout room, the first thing we would like for you to do is to determine who is going to be person one, two, three, and four using alphabetical order of your first name. So as you can see from this example, Angie would be person number one because her name comes first alphabetically. David would be person two, Melissa would be person three, and then Sam would be person four. 
Once you've made that determination, we're going to ask that you record the names for each person on your team and the number that they are going to be on your participant handout. So you're going to see a place to put that right at the top of the page. Um, we're just going to use this to help us structure and manage both some of the breakout room and the whole group conversations today. Then once you finish with that, the last thing we want you to do is a single round robin. So single means one time around. And when it's your turn, you're gonna share your response to all three of the following items. So your name, your role and location, and then one item on your bucket list and why it's on your list. So I'm gonna pause for just a minute to give you a little time to think, how will you respond to those three items when it's your turn in the single round robin? When you get to the single round robin, number one, would you please start it? So you're gonna go in order of one, two, three, and four. Every time today when we close a breakout room, you're gonna see a 15 second countdown timer pop up. That's just to let you know that you have 15 seconds to wrap up your conversation before you're automatically returned to the main session. Now we're gonna give you about four to five minutes to do everything that you see on the slide in this first breakout room. Please feel free to take a picture of the slide if you wanna have that to reference in the breakout room. And we also have posted this in the chat for you to see as well. So again, every Everything you see on the slide in about four minutes. Number one, start the single round robin when you get to it. We'll see you all back here in just a few minutes. Is there anybody left in the main room that did not receive an invite to a breakout room? I feel like I've gotten everybody on my side, but just want to make sure. We see some of you are starting to come back in. We still have a few more. We're waiting to join us before we um, move back into the presentation. There are some of you that like moved in and out of your breakout rooms really like super quick. And then we've got this other big group that it takes just a little bit longer for them to get in and out. And as we're <laughs> waiting for those last few people, we just asked for your patience today. Because we value the opportunity to give you time to talk to your colleagues about the information we're presenting. So some it may be a little bit slow getting in and out of those breakout rooms, but all of the breakout rooms we have today are very purposeful and meaningful. Um, and so we, we will definitely want to continue that as much as Zoom will allow us in terms of the speed that it's working today. So Mickey, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Misty. So first and foremost today, we want to acknowledge that we realize that this year has posed numerous unique challenges due to the pandemic. And from the beginning, the standards implementation process, it, it was already difficult due to the fact that multiple standards documents were approved and published at one time. But we also are sensitive to the fact that this period of extended hybrid and or remote learning resulting from the COVID-19 emergency presents many more obstacles that are frankly just not evident in traditional in-person classroom instruction. So as a result, we want to help and we want to provide supports to local schools and districts to assist you in returning to a new normal, whatever that may look like for you at the local level. Yet in doing so, we want to keep best practice at the forefront. So we're going to begin with an examination of student equity today and, and just think about why standards matter. 
And we know that the standards outline the minimum learning requirements and establish a statewide baseline for what each and every Kentucky student should know and be able to do at the end of each grade or grade band, kindergarten through grade 12. Thus, the focus of standards implementation is on students and student access to grade level learning experiences and their long term success. So we're going to revisit the opportunity myth. The new teacher project published the opportunity myth report in 2018 and the study findings have helped to shape our statewide commitments to student learning, but they've also guided professional learning supports for standards implementation. So there were four main findings within the study. And the first one there that you can see, most students do what they are asked to do in school, but are still not ready to succeed after school. And this highlights the importance of student exposure to grade level assignments. The study found that students succeeded on 71% of their assignments, but they met grade level standards on only 17% of those same assignments. So this reveals that even though most students are meeting the demand of their assignments, they are not prepared for a successful transition because too few assignments allow them to actually engage with grade level standards aligned learning. Secondly, there, even in classrooms where students did have grade appropriate assignments, TNTP often saw students missing out on strong instruction. And what they meant by that was particular opportunities for students to do the thinking. So of the nearly 900 foundational content lessons that they observed, only about one third had grade level content and only 74 had grade level content and ask students to do the thinking. So when we're thinking about equity, we must consider who is not given access to learning experiences that are aligned to grade level standards and that allow them to do the thinking. Number three there shows that th this data, it's reveals that it, this inequitable access is not random. The study found that students of color and students from low income backgrounds were 25% less likely to receive grade level assignments. And they also received less than half the amount of high quality lessons. Yet when given the chance to complete grade level work, classrooms with mostly students of color perform similar to their peers in classrooms with mostly students who are white. And then so to address these inequities, if you see number four there, they found that greater access to four key resources can and does improve student achievement. So I want to revisit those quickly. The four key resources are consistent opportunities to work on great appropriate assignments, strong instruction where students do most of the thinking in a lesson, deep engagement in what they're learning, and again that it references standards aligned learning, but also those opportunities for students to do the thinking. And then number four, teachers who hold high expectations for students and believe they can meet the grade level standards. So greater access to these four resources, again, it can and does improve student outcomes, but it's particularly found for those students who start the school year behind. So we want to continue to prioritize these resources and see them as commitments to each and every Kentucky student. But I do want to acknowledge that we realize that this TNTP study is just one, but other research such as Marzano's and Hattie's confirms the need for these commitments to student learning. We also know that statewide proficiency data shows similar gaps in reading and in mathematics for African American students, those who are economically disadvantaged, English learners, and students with disabilities. So to address some of this student equity. In, in July of 2020, the Kentucky Board of Education passed a resolution affirming its commitment to racial equity in Kentucky public schools. And I just want to read that first bullet there. It says the resolution states that every student in the Commonwealth deserves equitable access to effective educators who have unique experiences and perspectives, quality preparation, and are committed to the success of all learners. So what I want us to consider is you know, what are the deliberate actions that we're challenged with as educators. How can we ensure equitable access to learning for each and every student across the state? And standards implementation, local school and district implementation of the Kentucky Academic Standards is one deliberate action. Another action step is providing high quality standards aligned instructional resources to both students and teachers. And we will be discussing more regarding both of these action steps today. 
So today's session is broken down into four smaller learning um, sections, but the learning goal will remain the same for all four. So we are learning about resources that support standards implementation and promote student equity. And like Mickey said earlier, we know that the pandemic has posed several unique challenges to schools and districts over the past year. And we, as we start to move to the other side of the pandemic and toward again, whatever that new normal is going to be, we need to think about what are those key practices that we know from the research um, can help us and to make a significant difference in tackling the challenges ahead. So today we're gonna to be looking at some of those key practices and the resources that we have to support you in that work. So in section one, we're gonna focus on high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning. In section two, we're gonna examine the role of PLCs. In section three, we're gonna take a closer look at balanced assessments, specifically the formative assessment process. And then in section four, we are going to introduce you to the new Kentucky MTSS framework. But right now, we're going to move into section one, where we want to look at high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning, how they support standards implementation, promote student equity, and is a key practice in helping us tackle the challenges ahead. So by the end of section one, we want you to be able to differentiate the role of standards, curriculum, and instructional resources. We want you to be able to define high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning and explain how they support both student and teacher equity. And finally, you know where you can access tools and resources to support the evaluation and the selection of HQIRs at the local level. Now, one of the main resources that we have available to support you in addressing many of the key practices we're going to talk about today is the model curriculum framework. The model curriculum framework is something that is outlined in Kentucky state law, and it is designed to provide um, guidance to schools and districts in the areas of curriculum development, as, as the selection of instructional resources, as well as in assessment and instructional strategies. Last year, we began revising the model curriculum framework to still align with the purpose laid out in legislation, but to also better meet the current needs that we see at the local level around these key areas within the document. To access the model curriculum framework, you can go to kystandards.org and then once there, you're going to click on your standards resources. And then under general resources, you're going to see it is the second icon listed. So when you click on that model curriculum framework icon, it will take you to a page where you can then download the complete version of that document. Now, one important note about the model curriculum framework, it is meant to be a reference guide. So this is not something that you would sit down and read cover to cover. It is there as a support to schools and districts whenever they are working to address one of the key areas within this document. Last February, we released the first two sections of the revised framework, and they were the focus of March leadership meetings last year. You can access a recording of that meeting on kystandards.org, but we do want to provide you with just a quick refresher of that information today. So the introduction section one differentiates the role of standards, curriculum, and instructional resources, as well as who has the responsibility for each as defined in Kentucky law. And it is so important that we start with a clear understanding of each of these terms because it impacts all of our work on all of the areas addressed within this document. So the standards address a foundational framework of what is to be learned. So they are the minimum of what students have to know and be able to do by the end of a grade level. So the standards are the what. The curriculum addresses how learning experiences are designed at the local level. So the curriculum focuses and connects the work of classroom teachers across a school or district to the standards, their classroom assessment, and their classroom instruction that is necessary for students to meet the grade levels or grade level expectations. So the curriculum is how the standards are implemented at the local level. The instructional resources are defined as the print, non-print, or electronic medium designed to assist student learning. So no one resource can ever make up a curriculum aligned to the Kentucky standards. So the instructional resources support the implementation of a locally developed curriculum that is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards. And we recognize there's a lot of misconceptions around the state when it comes to those terms. So to help us better communicate a common language and a common understanding, we've created this graphic. And as you can see, it highlights the difference as well as who has the responsibility for each. 
One thing you will notice at the top is instead of just saying instructional resources, this says high quality instructional resources. And here within section one, we're gonna talk about what we mean by high quality instructional resources and why they are important. When it comes to the responsibility, you can see that it is the responsibility of the state to establish the standards, the minimum of what students have to know and be able to do. But when it comes to the development of the curriculum that's aligned to the standards and the selection of the instructional resources to support implementation, that responsibility is at the local level. So then what support and guidance can we offer to schools and districts around that work? Well, that is where section two of the model curriculum framework comes into play that we released last February. It is the curriculum development process. So it just outlines a possible process that schools and districts can use to develop a local curriculum that is aligned to the Kentucky academic standards. And within that process, there are three main phases with specific action steps to support the work of each phase. As we listen to feedback from the Quality Curriculum Task Force, who greatly informed the work within this process, they highlighted the need for more specific support and guidance around um, phase two, step five, in the identification and the selection of instructional resources and professional learning necessary to support implementation. And this matches with feedback we've heard from other educators around the state. And the need for this has definitely been elevated as a result of the pandemic. We know that the pandemic did not suddenly make teaching harder. It has been hard for quite some time, but it did expose underlying issues around student equity and resource availability. The job of a teacher has always been challenging, but the pandemic showed us just how challenging it can be. And we know that teachers are spending huge amounts of time simply searching for resources or creating their own from scratch. We also know that the impact of the pandemic has been uneven, with vulnerable students hit the hardest. And that makes it even more critically important that teachers have access to high quality instructional resources that are designed to help them meet the needs of students at all different levels. Because at the end of the day, teachers deserve access to high quality instructional resources. So instead of spending all of their time searching for resources or creating their own from scratch, they can focus their time and energy on utilizing the HQI to meet the needs of their students and engage them in the learning. We want to show you what we do currently have available to support schools and districts in the evaluation and the selection of high quality instructional resources. So on KY standards, when you go under general resources, you're going to see an icon that will say high quality instructional resources. When you click on that, it's gonna give you access to our instructional resources alignment rubrics. And you can see all of the pages that we have those available for. And when it comes to instructional resources, we know that there have been so many challenges at the local level around this particular thing, this particular practice, because first of all, there's been a lack of state funding for the last few years to even purchase instructional resources at the local level. And then even like Mickey said, last school year, the year that this pandemic started was the same school year in which multiple new sets of standards were released. So we know that the pandemic likely hindered the curriculum and instructional resource alignment work that would have taken place at the local level. Because of all of this, we know that we need to greatly expand the resources and support that we have in this area. So that brings us to our high quality instructional resource strategic plan. Would everyone take just a second and read the goal, the first bullet of the page of our plan? As you can see, it is about giving schools and districts the information they need to select high quality instructional resources that promote student equity and access to those four key commitments that Mickey talked about earlier. So as a part of our plan, we want to communicate and promote our definitions and rationale for high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning. And in year one, we want to start with reading and writing with the goal of providing schools and districts with a consumer guide that includes selection criteria and evaluation tools to support purchasing instructional resources that are aligned to the reading and writing standards in Kentucky. But where we are right now and where we're going to be throughout the spring is starting to develop that common language and understanding by communicating and promoting KDE's definition and rationale for HQIRs and HQPL. 
But before we share our definitions and rationale with you, we want to give you an opportunity to activate your own background knowledge. So in your participant handout, on page one at the very top, you should see a graphic organizer that looks similar to this. So I want to pause for just a second and let you get that in front of you. And here is your question. What is your current thinking about high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning? Specifically, what might be a description or some characteristics that you could think of for each, as well as what are some possible connections to student and teacher equity for each? We are going to give you about two to three minutes of some silent thinking and writing time for you to record your current thinking in column one of your graphic organizer. Then we're going to come back together and share out. So again, I'm just going to pause here for about two to three minutes, let you jot down your current thinking in column one. Take about another 30 seconds. And now let's come back together. So in just a minute, we're going to do a whole group chat where you're going to post some of your thinking in the chat. But before we do that, let me set you up for how we're going to do this. First of all, please know that column two on your graphic organizer is going to be a place for you to add any new thoughts or ideas that you see posted in the chat that maybe you didn't capture in column one. So we are going to start with high quality instructional resources. So I would like for everyone in the chat just to please post something that you put down as maybe a description or a characteristic or a connection to equity around high quality instructional resources. So please start posting those in the chat now. Aligned to the standards, research or evidence based, rigorous, um, diverse and accessible for all students, supports learning for all students, externally validated, engaging, innovative, um, at grade level, student centered, collaborative, consistent across the district, vetted by professionals, multi tiered, culturally relevant, various ways to facilitate implementation free from bias, inclusive. You guys are putting so many great ideas in here. Diverse and relevant, customizable for student needs. Accessible and ongoing. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for just a second and I want you to just quickly scan through everything that was posted in the chat and what are maybe a couple of things that you did not have in column one that you want to add in column two around high quality instructional resources. So many good ideas in that chat, you all. So now we're going to switch to high quality professional learning. 
So please in the chat, would you post something that you put as maybe a description, a characteristic or connections to student and teacher equity. So again, high quality professional learning. Ongoing, absolutely. Applicable, relevant, can be practically applied back to the classroom, connected to PLCs, job embedded, reflects best practice, allows for collaboration, it's about practice, not just theory. Reflective product development where they're walking away with something they can use. Promote accessing learning, personalized growth for the teachers. Impacts student learning, personalized for educators. Empowering to our teachers. All teachers involved, both general and special ed. So again, I'm gonna pause here. And if there's anything in the chat around high quality professional learning that you maybe didn't have in column one, please feel free to add it to column two. And thank you all so much for participating in that chat and putting your great ideas in there. And now as I get ready to hand it over to Carrie, who is going to share KDE's definition and rationale with you, I just want to let you know that column three, it is designed as a place for you to write down any new ideas um, or thoughts that you hear from the information we are going to present to you around each of these terms. So I'm going to hand it over to Carrie now. Thank you, Misty. So now that you've had an opportunity to activate your background knowledge around HQIRs and share that thinking in the chat with others, we want to share KDE's definition of high quality instructional resources. So the KDE defines HQIRs as materials that are aligned with Kentucky academic standards, research-based and or externally validated, comprehensive to include engaging texts, problems and assessments, so by comprehensive, we mean that the resources address the full scope of the standards for each grade, and they include an array of pedagogical and instructional supports to meet the diverse needs of students. And by text, we mean both print and non-print resources to include books, multimedia presentations, videos, et cetera. So culturally relevant, free from bias, really thinking about acknowledging students' ethnic, racial, and linguistic identities within the context of their grade level work in a way that is not clouded by unnecessary barriers that get in the way of student learning. And finally, materials that are accessible for all students. So ensuring equitable opportunities for all students, regardless of their unique experiences and qualities, to receive instruction that uses high quality instructional resources so students can engage meaningfully in the learning process and have an opportunity to demonstrate their thinking. So now that you've had an opportunity to hear a little bit about why HQIRs are important, we're going to give you some time to read through the definition of high quality instructional resources, why they are needed, and what the research says on the flyer you printed for today. Using your participant handout, Misty just had you record on earlier, we want you to individually read through the flyers, capturing any overall noticings, characteristics, and connections to student equity or standards implementation. You can record your thinking in that third column of your participant handout if you like. So I'm going to pause and give you about three or four minutes of quiet reading time now.
Okay, if you'll take about 30 more seconds. I'm going to ask you to pause right where you are is right where you need to be. And as you just read on the high quality instructional resources flyer, providing teachers with a set of instructional resources without providing them with professional learning focused on how to implement those resources effectively will not impact student achievement. So HQIRs and HQPL go hand in hand in providing equitable opportunities for students and teachers. We know from research that access to a local curriculum and high quality instructional resources aligned to the CAS is not enough to ensure equity in all classrooms. In order to meet the learning needs of all students and create engaging culturally relevant learning environments, we need to provide professional learning aligned to helping teachers effectively implement and use high quality instructional resources. Getting high quality instructional resources in the hands of teachers is the first step, but knowing how to effectively implement those resources in a way that offers teachers ongoing coaching, support, and time for feedback and reflection is where we have to be careful not to fall short. And so now that you've had an opportunity to read about KDE's definition of HQIRs and hear how HQIRs and HQPL are connected, we're going to give you some time to read through the characteristics on the flyer you see here. Just as we had you do for the HQIR flyer, you're going to have some time now to read over the high quality professional learning flyer and capture your thinking in that third column of your participant handout. We're going to give you about four to five minutes of quiet reading time before you have an opportunity to share out your thinking with others in a breakout room. So, I'm going to pause here and start my timer and give you a, a few minutes of quiet reading time.
Okay, I'm going to ask you to push pause. If you have not finished reading yet, it is okay. Uh, we are going to have some transition time as we move into breakout rooms in just a moment. So you will have probably a minute or two to wrap up your reading if you did not get finished. So when we go into the breakout room, we're going to do an open discussion. So you're going to feel free to discuss any new thoughts or ideas you noted regarding KDE's definitions and rationales for high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning. This will be an informal, less structured discussion, but you'll want to make sure everyone in your group has had an opportunity to share out. So watch for that broadcast message at the top as we'll broadcast a countdown when time is almost up. And as we've done before, we're going to pause before we start the time to give a chance for everyone to get into their breakout rooms. So if you haven't already, have that participant handout ready and be prepared to share in your breakout room. And we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Scott, I just wanted to check in to see if you were able to get your microphone working or if you want to try to unmute now and, and talk. Is it working now? That's working well. Do you remember what room you were in? Um, uh, room one. Room one. All right. Awesome. I'll send you there. Thank you. All right. Thanks for checking, Thomas. muting myself. Welcome back everyone. It looks like we uh, have most everyone back. Uh, we're still waiting on just a few more. And so at this time, we'd like to invite you to share one takeaway or next step from your reflection in the chat. So feel free to unmute and share out or share your thinking in the chat box now. So looking at question one there, what was one idea that really resonated with you regarding high quality instructional resources? So we see research-based, not just a shiny new thing, I love that, evidence-based, I think something Misty said early on with its the resources and the curriculum and making sure that that's clear with teachers um, because they should be focusing on that instructional piece in the classroom and responding in real time with the students. So how to have them not hold too tightly to right. the resource as well. Yes, I agree, Julie. Thank you for sharing that. I also see some comments here about sticking with it. So that follow-up piece is very important, making sure that it's evidence-based, um, content-focused, using research strategies, coaching. Making sure teachers have professional learning needed to provide effective instruction. So I see some of you are already making those connections there between high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning. Gaps for our students. Yeah, so Shauna said we talk about gaps 
of our students, but a lack of systemic approach to high quality instructional resources can lead to gaps for our teachers, which we know can potentially lead to further gaps for our students. So I think that's important. We have to really think through the lens of how can we accelerate student learning? Um, importance of feedback and reflection. Okay, so now let's shift gears just a little bit and now let's think about your conversations in your breakout room around high quality professional learning. So feel free to unmute and share or again you can share in the chat box here. What was one thing that really resonated you with you regarding the characteristics of high quality professional learning? For me as a coach, um, it was not so much that there was a shock that professional learning and instructional resources are intertwined, but a lot of times it's very, very easy to provide the instructional resources, but we chunk our professional learning maybe too small, or we maybe don't provide as in-depth professional learning um, as we should at times. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. Yeah, we know um, from coaching experience that you know, teachers need to know how to implement those high quality instructional resources, but the two are really interconnected in thinking about high quality instructional resources and high quality professional learning. So our professional learning needs to involve those uh, resources that teachers are using on a day-to-day -day, um, and week-to-week -week basis. So thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? And Emily said it's important during high quality professional learning to provide teachers with adequate time to learn, practice, implement, and keep that focus. Um, continue, not, a, not just a one and done approach. So thank you for sharing that. Lots of great responses in the chat. Go slow to go fast. Absolutely, Scott. Okay, so I'm gonna move us along for the sake of time. And just to give you a little more information than what you read about in the flyer, we know that high quality instructional resources are an equity issue for both students and for teachers. And then when teachers do not have access to high quality instructional resources, they spend on average seven to 12 hours per week searching for resources online. However, sometimes the quality of those resources are lacking and studies by Marcy Goldberg have found that students of color from low income families are impacted most. In fact, a 2017 study by RAND supports that this is a common occurrence because 96% of teachers surveyed use Google and 75% of teachers were using Pinterest to find their lessons and resources. So the Fordham Institute conducted a review of those instructional resources and found that 64% of those resources, quote, should not be used or are probably, quote, not worth using. Mm -hmm. So on the web so websites they reviewed, a majority of the materials were rated a zero or one on an overall zero to three quality scale. Because of the growing limits on teachers' time, we know that often what is most readily available is what teachers tend to gravitate to most. So it becomes increasingly more important for teachers to have access to high quality instructional resources that support the needs of their students as they implement grade level appropriate assignments and professional learning that increases their content knowledge in that implementation. High quality instructional resources are an issue of student equity also. We know from the opportunity myth findings that Mickey shared earlier, students of color, English learners, students from low income families, and those with mild to moderate disabilities are less likely to receive strong grade level instruction with high quality instructional resources than students from classrooms with mostly white students from higher income communities. I'm sure we would agree that all students deserve access to standards aligned instructional resources and grade level assignments to help them reach the intended learning outcomes within the CAS. High quality instructional resources help to ensure that students receive engaging learning opportunities that take into account the cultural diversity and perspectives of their communities because all students are entitled to high quality resources to use, learn from, and guide their practice. 
So aside from knowing all students deserve an equitable education, why else should we consider high quality instructional resources? According to a Johns Hopkins study conducted by David Steiner in 2017, students in classrooms that use just one high quality instructional resource for four consecutive years outpace comparison students by a margin of 38 percentile points, equivalent to four additional years of learning. Another study found that the average cost effectiveness ratio to switching to HQIRs is almost 40 times that of class size reduction. So simply put, high quality instructional resources are one of the most cost effective ways we can increase student achievement. And furthermore, due to the pandemic, it is more important than ever that we choose high yield strategies and practices that equate to more than one year's growth in one year's time We're not talking about to that. really I accelerate student right learning. We can begin this work by giving our teachers and students access to high quality instructional resources. And so we read on the flyers that research demonstrates a positive link between high quality professional learning and high quality instructional resources. Both work in tandem to produce positive student outcomes. Therefore, when designing or selecting high quality professional learning at the local level, it's important to keep these characteristics in mind. So I'm gonna hit some highlights. When we talk about aligned with state standards, so this involves making sure that the professional learning you select or create clearly aligns to the Kentucky academic standards and your district CDIP and CSIP goals. Content focus. So incorporating teaching strategies and pedagogies intentionally designed for each, dis each of the disciplines. So math, reading, science, social studies, et cetera. Sustain and continuous. So are the professional learning opportunities a one and done approach or are teachers given opportunities to revisit content through coaching and support as they grow in their understanding and readiness for new information? So those are just some of the highlights, but as we think of refocusing and coming back this fall, we want you to start considering how you can embed these characteristics of high quality professional learning in the professional learning you offer. And so the Kentucky Department of Education will be conducting a pilot to offer professional learning support to schools and districts as they begin to implement the curriculum development process and work to understand how they will begin to embed high quality inst instructional resource selection within that process. The pilot will provide schools and districts with free professional learning as well as resources and guidance and how they can begin to select high quality reading and writing resources that align to their locally developed curriculum to the reading and writing standards. We will then use the feedback we gather from the pilot to assist us in refining our high quality instructional resource work moving forward. Our current plan is to begin soliciting applications in October of this year and notify selected pilot participants before winter break so that pilots can then convene with us starting in February. And so we know we've given you a lot of information here. So individually on that participant handout, we wanna give you an opportunity to reflect on your learning around HQIRs and HQPL, capturing what is most important for you to remember as well as some possible next steps for sharing this learning back in your own school or district. So we're going to pause and give you just a minute or two to write down quietly.
Okay, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Misty, and she's going to share more about Section 2 of the Model Curriculum Framework on Professional Learning Communities. And then before we move on, one final note we do want to make about high quality instructional resources is we definitely do not want anyone to think the message we are sending is that you just got to scratch everything you have and start completely over. What we really recommend is that you start with those instructional resources alignment rubrics and use those to evaluate what you currently have available to see how many of the characteristics of high quality instructional resources that they may be neat and then decide what might you need to purchase to help supplement to give teachers that full array of the resources that they need. So again, just kind of take stock of what you have, where you are, and again, what might be needed to give the teachers equip them with what will align to all of those characteristics. So again, please don't think we're telling you just scratch everything you have. Just use this time to really evaluate what you currently have and where gaps might be and supplemental resources that can support. So now we're going to move into section two and examine the role of PLCs in supporting strong standards or supporting standards implementation and promoting student equity. And we recognize that around the state, most schools and districts are probably in some stage of implementation around PLCs. But again, the pandemic probably caused some challenges to that continued implementation. But we know from the research that PLCs are one of those key practices that can make a significant difference in student outcomes, but only when the PLCs are focused on the right work. So we're gonna spend our time in section two gaining clarity around PLCs and the work that defines that process. So as we move into section two, we want you to be able to explain the importance of PLCs in supporting strong standards aligned instruction and promoting student equity. We want you to just be able to identify the ideas and questions that frame the work of a high performing PLC and that you know where you can go to access tools and resources to support implementation. Now, in their work, both um, John Hattie and Robert Marzano talk about the importance of two factors that can significantly improve student outcomes. We know the greatest school level factor is access to a guaranteed and viable curriculum, and the greatest classroom level factor is access to quality classroom instruction. And we've already been talking about the importance of these this morning, but if we know that both of those things are critically important, then the questions become, how do we ensure alignment between curriculum and instruction. So how do we ensure that this locally developed written curriculum that's aligned to the Kentucky academic standards is what's actually implemented in classrooms across the school or district? And that is the role of PLCs. PLCs can help to bridge the gap between the two and ensure that all students are taught the same knowledge and skills regardless of the teacher they are assigned. And when we, uh, when we look at the research on the benefits of PLC, so many of those um, help to directly connect to you and promote student equity, as well as really teacher equity. So as teachers work collaboratively in effective PLCs, with effective being the key word here, we know that it results in reduced teacher isolation in terms of their practice and in meeting the needs of all students. When teachers work in silos, they often don't have a true understanding of the impact of their instructional strategies because they have nothing in which to compare it to. And also when they struggle with finding um, instructional strategies and approaches, there's no support for them. And when it comes to meeting the needs of all students, no one single teacher, no matter how talented he or she may be, can meet the needs of every single individual student in their class by themselves. But PLCs provide the supportive context for teachers to improve their practice and help them meet the needs of their students. And there's a lot of work through that PLC process that contributes to it. So as teachers work together to break down, to analyze and break down the standards for each unit of instruction, we know that that results in an increased shared understanding of the standards and what they're asking students to know and be able to do. So when teachers work collaboratively in a PLC to, uh, to agree upon what the students have to know and be able to do in that unit to meet the standards, how they're going to assess if students have met those expectations, and they all agree on what success looks like, then that ensures that students across the grade or across the classroom are held to the same grade level expectations because teachers have developed that shared understanding. 
And we also know that when teachers come back together after giving a common assessment and they analyze the results, it results in an increased understanding of effective instructional practice, like what approaches um, and what strategies were most successful in helping students re or reach the grade level expectations. And that results in greater consistency in delivering high quality instruction to all students. So, so many of the benefits of PLCs connect directly back with providing access to the four key commitments to our students. But again, that effective or that um, key word there is effective. So I also want to make a quick note or quick note about how um, high quality instructional resources can support PLCs. So when teachers have access to HQIRs within the PLC, it helps them in creating their common assessments because if their resources are aligned to the standards, they know they can pull assessment items from those resources that are aligned to the standards and the grade level expectations, again, helping to ensure that students are all held to the same expectations. Additionally, we know that when teachers have access to those high quality resources, it allows them to more easily provide students with um, access to grade appropriate assignments, because again, the resources have embedded to be aligned to the standards. Now, we want to spend our time going back to what do we mean by an effective PLC? So gaining a little clarity around the PLC process. But once again, we wanna start with activating your background knowledge. So I want you to think about PLCs that you have been a part of over the years or that you have observed and what are two or three of the most common activities, discussions, and or work that you have seen take place. And please don't think we want you to give certain answers. We just want you to be honest. What's the most common work that you see taking place in a PLC? So everyone just think for a minute. And then as you have an idea, please post those in the chat. So two or three of the most common things that you see in a PLC. Planning the next week's lessons, sharing ideas, assessment data, reviewing student data, a lot of things about um, data, reactive conversation, very interesting, yep. Um, student data, analysis of student work, planning for remediation, creating common assessments, um, lesson planning, um, planning and student work analysis, discussing students, complaining. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see, we have some commonalities in what we have um, in the chat, but we also have some differences. But if we really want PLCs to help us improve student outcomes, then we have to get insanely clear on the work they should be doing during that time. Um, I also see like discussing stu uh, student participation, deconstructing the standards. So what I want you to do right now is let's start with what a PLC is not. So take just a minute and read the quote that you see on the screen taken from an article by Doug Reeves and Rick DeFore. So as you can see, a PLC is not a program that you can purchase, implement in a year, and then move on. It is a process of continuous improvement. It's also not a book study, especially one that results in no change in teacher practice. And then we also know that it is not just any meeting in which two or more teachers are gathered together, because when they are in that PLC, there's specific work that defines the collaborative process. And that does not mean that there are not other important reasons for which teachers may need to meet, but if we're calling it and we're using PLCs, then we need to make sure they're focused on the right work. So to help us gain a little clarity in PLCs, we are going to read an excerpt from the PLC section in the model curriculum framework that we released just a couple of months ago. So I'm going to pause and give everyone a chance to get this reading in front of you. It's in your participant handout. If you didn't have time to pr uh, print it, that's okay. I know we posted a link to it in the chat just now. So I'm just going to pause and let you get that reading in front of you. So clarity in PLCs. 
And now let me give you your purpose for reading. We're gonna tie back to two of our success criteria for this section. So as you read, I want you to find out what are the ideas and questions that frame the work of a high-performing PLC, as well as any connections that you see to how PLC supports strong standards aligned instruction and promotes student equity. So anytime you come across something in the reading that ties back to these success criteria, please feel free to annotate in any way that works best for you. We're gonna give you about five minutes, or I'm sorry, about four minutes of some silent reading time. Again, annotating for the purpose that you see on the screen before we come back together and go into breakout rooms to process what you've read. So again, about four minutes here of some silent reading time. Okay, find a stopping point and let's come back together. Again, we know that you probably have not read it all yet, but we have that transition time into breakout rooms where you're going to be able to finish up that reading. Um, but I do want to set you up for how we would like for you to process in your breakout rooms. So the first thing we're going to ask you to do is once we see that most people are in their breakout rooms, we are going to broadcast a message that we want you to do a continuous round robin. So continuous just means you keep going around and around and every time it's your turn, you're going to share one idea. And your idea is going to be something from the reading that you found that relates to our success criteria. 
Then after about a minute and a half, we're going to broadcast a message for you to then switch to an open discussion. So we want you to stick to that continuous round robin until we broadcast a message to switch, because we just want to give you a chance to get all the ideas out there that you found in the reading so that when you move to that open discussion, you can then ask questions of each other, make connections, you can elaborate. But again, we're going to start with the continuous round robin and number twos, we would like for you to start it. So you're going to go in order of two, three, four, one. Wait until we broadcast a message, though, for you to actually begin that continuous round robin, because we want to wait until we can see most people are in the breakout room. So just use that little bit of lag time to finish up your reading. So we'll see you back here in just a few minutes and watch for that broadcasted message to begin. See some of you all coming back. Welcome. It seems like we get two big surges of people coming out of breakout rooms. We get this first rush of people and then there's a lag time until we get that second group back in. Looks like our second group slowly starting to come back in now. It looks like we have most people back. Um, you all, one thing we just want to let you know, as much as possible, we want to keep you in a, the same breakout room each time. But as people have to leave the meeting for different purposes, if we look and see that someone is in a breakout room by themselves and you suddenly see a, an invitation pop up to join a new one, it's just because we recognize that you're in a room by yourself and we wanted to move you into a room with other people to give you a chance to have that dialogue. So if you see things like that happening, it's just because we're trying to make sure everyone has an opportunity to have this professional dialogue and kind of move people around as we need to. So apologize if it takes you out of a room where with people you love, it's just they're not in the meeting anymore. And we want to make sure you again have someone to talk to. Okay, here's what I would like for you to do. I want you to think about either from the reading or your breakout room conversation, what was one big takeaway that you had thinking about our two success criteria. So something related to the success criteria that was a major takeaway or something that really resonated with you. So everyone just think and get that idea in your head. And then if you are a number three in your team, number threes, we're gonna let you be the instant star here. Number threes, would you please share that takeaway either by unmuting or posting it in the chat? Um, again, we love hearing your voices, so please don't be afraid to unmute and share. So I'm gonna pause and I'm just gonna turn it over to any number threes to post either in the chat or share with the group. So key takeaways. Co-labor on the right work. Yes. Thank you, Diane. Data focused. Absolutely. It's not do we collaborate, but what do we collaborate about? Absolutely. Expectations. Love the driving questions. There should um, they should be utilized as a standing agenda format. Absolutely. Mutual accountability. And Lindsay, we're coming back to that one in just a minute. Thank you. Again, you all feel free to unmute and share too. Focus and emphasis on learning. Absolutely. Greater than just what how they're going to teach it. It's are the students learning it. I love that. Okay, so we are going to move on. And one thing that I want to do is just quickly kind of highlight back to what we were discussing. We know that when a school or district has fully embraced the PLC process, there are three big ideas that would be pervasive uh, within their culture. First would be a laser-like focus on learning, not just for the students, but for the adults as well. 
we would see a collaborative culture where um, everyone knows that um, where everyone has a role to play with that collective responsibility. And it is an expectation of the job that you will work in a collaborative team that is focused on improving student learning. And one of the things I love about that collective responsibility is the mind shift that you see that it's no longer about me, but it's about we and it's not just about my students in my classroom, but it's about our students in our classrooms. And then finally, like someone mentioned in the chat, they're driven driven by results orientation, where the evidence of student learning impacts decisions at all levels of the school or district. Now, within those three big ideas, we see those four driving questions that frame the work of an effective PLC. So anytime teachers are meeting in what is called their PLC time, what they're doing should be anchored back to addressing one of these key questions that you see. And I just want to uh, quickly address a common misconception we see around the PLC process and teacher autonomy. Um, the PLC process is not designed to create cookie cutter teachers who are reading from a script on the same day at the exact same time doing exactly the same instructional strategies with every single class. That's not what it's about. Questions one and two, as they move into a unit of instruction, is designed so that teachers come to a shared understanding of this is what we think the standards are asking students to know and be able to do. This is how we all agree to assess it. And this is what we all agree success looks like. They're going to create those common assessments. They're going to determine when they're going to give those common assessments. Then they individually return back to their own classrooms and they are going to plan their lessons. They're going to design their instruction and deliver that instruction. Using Using the instructional strategies and approaches of their choice. That is where the creativity and the artistry and the personality of the teacher comes into play. But like someone mentioned in the chat earlier, there's mutual accountability in a PLC. So while they get the freedom to choose that in their instruction, each time they come together to analyze the results of a common assessment, First and foremost, they're using those results to determine the effectiveness of the instructional strategies they use. So if I'm in a PLC and one of my colleagues, 95% of his or her students met the intended learning outcomes, but only 40% of mine did, I have to admit my instructional strategies and approach did not work for most of my students. So I need to see what did my colleague use? What were those approaches that were significantly more impactful than mine? And how can I begin to understand those and incorporate those into my practice to improve the effectiveness of my instruction. And also what you might see sometimes in a PLC is where they come together as a group and they realize as they analyze the data, maybe few students across the board met the intended learning outcomes. Well, if that's the case, that's where we go back to that collaborative culture and collective responsibility. So as a PLC, we are going to research what are some instructional strategies and approaches that can support student understanding in this area. We're all going to grow in our understanding of them and begin to implement them back into our practice to help impact student learning for all of our students. So just a couple of um, things we wanted to kind of highlight within that. Now, to finish up this PLC section, in the PLC section, there is a portion that will address the role of leadership. We know from the research that it is critical that leaders create the culture necessary for effective PLC implementation. So within this area, we talk about four key strategies that leaders can use. And these strategies actually apply to implementation of any continuous improvement initiative, but here we examine them through the lens of PLCs. So strategy one is about establishing that clear vision and purpose of why PLCs are needed and how will they help us achieve our school district goals. Then strategy two is about creating the clarity and coherence so that everyone knows the language of PLCs, the work that defines that collaborative time, so there's a common understanding throughout the school or district. Then strategy three is about leaders putting the systems and structures in place that's necessary for staff to effectively implement PLCs and do the work that's being asked of them. And then finally, it's that monitoring of implementation to determine what is working, what is not working, and what is that one next step we continu continuously take to improve. And then finally, 
The last portion of the PLC section in the model curriculum framework is really for teachers. What does it mean to be an effective teacher or an effective member of a PLC? And you can see it starts with building trust. You have to have trust to address those four driving questions. Then we break it down into what is the annual work of the PLC and what is the recurring work of a PLC. So annual at the beginning of every year, no matter how many years those teachers may have worked together, they are going to um, create their team norms and they are going to establish a SMART goal that is based on prior student achievement to which all members are mutually accountable for helping to reach that goal. And then the recurring work is what they do for each unit of instruction as they address those driving questions. So that brings us to our last success criteria that we had within section two. Where can you go to access tools and resources to support whatever stage of implementation you might be in to help support your next steps? In the model curriculum framework in Appendix B, we created a leadership toolkit. So for each of those four leadership strategies, there is a toolkit to support implementation. And this is just a snapshot from that first toolkit on establish the vision and purpose. So you can see that each one has specific action steps, the purpose of that step, considerations when working through this step, and then additional tools and resources to support implementation. So Appendix B in the Model Curriculum Framework, that's the Leadership Toolkit. Then Appendix C is the Teacher Toolkit. So again, there are two toolkits in there. There's one for the annual work, and there's one for the recurring work. You can see it's laid out in the same way as the leadership toolkit, but when it comes to the tools and resources, oftentimes teachers need some structured like protocols to help them when they're initially beginning to implement some of these um, or addressing some of these questions. So you're gonna see examples of protocols, planning templates, whatever we thought might be helpful to teachers as they work through addressing each of those questions. So again, Appendix B, Leadership Toolkit, Appendix C is the Teacher Toolkit. So we know that was a lot to take in and please know that today is really meant to be an awareness day. We're gonna be developing more in-depth trainings around all of these topics moving forward, but we wanna give you time before we move into the next section for you to reflect on this around PLC. So on your participant handout, page two with the PLC reflection, take just a couple of minutes to jot down what might be most important for you to remember and any possible next steps for taking this learning back to your school or district. So we're gonna pause and let you just have some silent thinking and writing time. Okay, I'm going to ask you to pause. Hopefully you had an opportunity to capture 
um, some reflections on this particular section on PLCs. So now we're going to move into our third section on today's agenda around a balanced system of assessment. And our learning goal for section three is to continue to learn about resources that support standards implementation and promote student equity. Now the three success criteria that we have, one is that you can explain the importance of the formative assessment process in supporting strong standards aligned instruction and promoting student equity. Second, that you can identify the key components of the formative assessment cycle and finally, that you are able to access tools and resources to support implementation of a balanced system of, system of assessment at the local level following our time together. So let's take a look at what we mean by a comprehensive balanced system of assessment. While some assessments are designed to provide evidence that focuses on the big picture by offering program feedback or annual yearly progress for a school or district, other assessment tools and practices are intended to provide guidance about where to go next in teaching and learning in the classroom. Just as the assessment stakeholders use are varied, so are the decisions those stakeholders make. Because different stakeholders need to make different kinds of educational decisions, there needs to be a variety of assessments that yield different types of evidence. There is no one size fits all assessment as we know. Assessments at all levels from classroom to state will work together in a system that is comprehensive, coherent, and continuous. Assessment balance is best achieved at the local level because only local education agencies have schools, classrooms, students, and teachers. School leaders at the local level are often tasked with aligning common learning expectations within a balanced system using assessments and assessment evidence for their intended purposes, creating the conditions necessary for effective assessment practices to take place, and most importantly, providing equitable opportunities for all students to provide and reflect on standards aligned evidence of their own learning. So then how do we create that balance? In a comprehensive balance system, there are four primary assessment purposes, formative, diagnostic, interim or benchmark, and summative. In order to achieve balance, all four assessment types must be present because they serve different purposes and provide us with different types of information to support educational decision-making. Assessment types can be differentiated by grain size, meaning the volume of learning expectations measured by the assessment, frequency, and how directly it can inform teaching and learning in the classroom. Today we'll be focusing on formative assessment, which is small in grain size because it functions at the classroom level. Think of it like the narrow end of a funnel. Teachers and students use day-to-day -day and minute-by-minute -minute formative assessment feedback to make adjustments to teaching and learning, which moves students closer to their learning goals. We know from pandemic teaching it is more important than ever to move students closer to their learning goals at an accelerated rate. So again, a variety of assessment types and grain sizes are needed to create a comprehensive balance system where all students' needs are met. To get us warmed up um, and get our brains to begin thinking about formative assessment, we're going to activate your background knowledge by getting you engaged in an assessment activity that you can replicate back in your school or district with students or staff. This universal response is called an emoji meter. But first, most importantly, you're going to need to go ahead and place your blinking cursor in that chat box before you do anything else. In just a minute, I'm going to pose a series of yes or no statements for you to answer using the emoji key you see on your screen. A heart for a yes answer, a frowny face for no, and a person shrugging their shoulders if you're not sure. Once your cursor is in the chat box, you can activate your emoji keyboard by using one of the three commands you see listed on the screen now. You'll want to use the one that matches the device you are currently using. So since I'm using a PC, for example, I would hold down the Windows key and press the period key. A menu of emoji should pop up. You will select the emoji in the chat that matches your response to the statements that follow and press enter. 
Now we don't wanna create any anxiety for anyone um, if this does not work on your device. So if your emoji keyboard does not work, you can simply type the words yes, no, or not sure in the chat box. So I'm gonna pause and let everyone place their cursor in that chat box now and try pulling up their emoji keyboard. So statement number one, any assessment can function formatively or summatively based on how you use it. So if you think the answer is yes, you'll place a heart in the chat box. If you think no, you'll place a sad face. And if you're not sure, you can do the person shrugging their shoulders. And again, feel free to type yes, no, or not sure. Seeing lots of yeses come in. So far, I'm seeing all yeses. Looks like most everyone has had an opportunity to respond. So the correct answer here was yes. Any assessment can function formatively or summatively depending on how it is used. So let's move on to our next statement. Statement number two. Acting on evidence of student learning is the most commonly used component of the formative assessment cycle. Yes, no, or not sure. Seeing some yeses. Still lots of yeses. Not sure. Julie says it should be, but teachers struggle with it. I see a no. Not sure, yes, not sure, not sure. Look, again, it looks like most everyone has had an opportunity to respond. So the correct answer here was actually no. Acting on evidence of student learning is the component of the formative assessment cycle that is the least used. And yes, Julie, it probably should be most used, but in fact, it is the least used. And our third and final statement, Formative assessment should make up the majority of a teacher's instructional practices. So yes, no, or not sure here. Seeing several yeses. Yes, lots of yeses here. Okay. The correct answer here was yes. According to researchers Dylan William and James Popham, formative assessment should make up the majority of a teacher's instructional practices as it gives students and teachers an opportunity to respond to the evidence of student learning that has been collected and interpreted. So now that we've activated our background knowledge around formative assessment, I want us to start thinking about the role that equity plays in the formative assessment process. As mentioned earlier, we know that to achieve a balanced assessment system, we have to provide equitable opportunities for all students to reflect on standards aligned evidence. This begins at the classroom level. For formative assessment to truly be equitable, we need to ensure that all students can engage meaningfully in the formative assessment process and have opportunities to show evidence of what they know and can do 
based on the feedback and supports we provide. By making learning affirming and meaningful for all students, we create a classroom uh, assessment culture where all students are invited to effectively manage their own learning and can demonstrate their thinking unclouded by barriers and biases. The graphic you see here identifies the specific practices that make up the formative assessment cycle and illustrates the practices that are grouped within each of the three foundational questions in the formative assessment process. Where am I going? Where am I now? And where to next? The practices in blue help teachers and students answer the question, where am I going? by establishing what students should be learning and what it will look like when they've learned it. These three practices, breaking down a standard, determining learning goals, and developing success criteria, criteria form the foundation for the remaining two sections. Teacher and student decisions about what evidence to elicit, how to interpret that evidence, and how to respond to that evidence all take place in the context of the established learning goals and success criteria. The practices in purple answer the question, where am I now, by eliciting evidence of student learning and making sense of that evidence. And finally, the practices in yellow answer the question, where to next. In this stage of the formative assessment cycle, teachers and students act on evidence in order to move students toward their intended learning goals. As the graphic illustrates, the formative assessment process is a continuous cycle. As students meet their goals, they circle back around and move towards a new cycle of learning. And within the formative assessment cycle, we have to provide equitable opportunities for all students to elicit, interpret, and reflect on standards aligned evidence of their own learning. So now that you've heard an overview of the formative assessment cycle, we're going to give you an opportunity to read an excerpt from the balanced assessment section of the model curriculum framework. This excerpt takes a deeper dive into the formative assessment process. As you read quietly to yourself, we want you to keep the following success criteria in mind. First, that you can identify the key components of the formative assessment cycle, and second, that you can explain how the formative assessment process promotes standards aligned instruction and student equity. In addition to keeping these in mind, as you read, we want you to highlight or underline three sentences or big ideas that really resonated with you. So I'm going to pause now and we're going to give you a few minutes of quiet reading time now.
Okay, I'm going to ask you to pause right where you are is right where you need to be. Hopefully you've had an opportunity to capture three big ideas or three sentences that really resonated with you. And so um, now we want you to individually identify two words from those three sentences or big ideas that you feel synthesizes the sen ideas or sentences that you marked. So we're going to go from three sentences or big ideas down to two words now. So I'm going to pause for just a minute and give you an opportunity to circle or box those two words. And so in just a moment, we're going to place you into breakout rooms. And once you get into your breakout rooms, we're going to ask number threes to start. In round robin fashion, you will each share out your three sentences and two words one at a time. Then we will broadcast a message. You will move into an open discussion to connect what you read or what you shared to the success criteria listed here, that you can identify the key components of the formative assessment cycle, and second, that you can explain how the formative assessment process promotes standards aligned instruction and student equity. And just as a reminder, be watching for a broadcast message at the top of your screen when time is almost up. So we will see you back here in just a few minutes. Welcome back everyone. Now that we have most everyone back, here's what we want you to do. In just a moment, we're going to participate in a waterfall chat. A waterfall chat is a great way to formatively assess where students are in their understanding. Waterfall chats give you a quick read in real time, so they're great for remote teaching. You can get it ready in the chat. You're not gonna enter your answer just yet, um, until I say submit, but you can go ahead and get your answer ready in that chat box. We want you to think about your one word from the text rendering strategy that sums up or synthesizes what you heard others in your group say. So I'm going to pause and let you think of your one word and get that ready in the chat box. It could be one of your two words that you circled or something you heard someone else say. So get that ready, but don't hit enter just yet. Ready and submit. Process, action, self-regulated, process, action, process, process, adjustment, feedback, success, responsive, feedback, actionable, responsive, shape instruction, actionable, feedback, great. Now for the second part of our share out, we want you to think about how that one word connects to the work you are doing in your school or district around standards aligned instruction, 
or promoting student equity. Now, this is gonna to be too long to type. So here, I'm just gonna ask you to unmute and share out if you'd like. It could be specific to your school district or region or a general connection between formative assessment and standards aligned instruction and student equity. So I'm going to pause for you to have a little bit of think time. And as you're ready, I'm going to invite you to unmute and share out. Well, I know in our district, we found that that piece about the process really resonated with us and that teachers were getting hung up on more of a strategy and not seeing that the formative assessment is not formative unless it informs uh, instruction moving forward. So we've been working on the formative learning cycle, Brookbank and Moss, their work, because we thought that even just kind of removing that specific word of assessment might help the teachers think of it differently and also think about the, the real time and the things they can do and react to that doesn't involve taking up papers and doing things like that, that they got kind of set in their mind um, previously when we talked about formative assessment. So it's all the same thing, but maybe getting them to really think about taking action on the evidence they gather. Thank you for sharing, Julie. You're exactly right. So really shifting teachers thinking into that mindset about it being a process rather than it being an exit slip or that piece of paper that they collect at the end of the day. Um, you're exactly right. So thank you for sharing that. And Aaron also said a paradigm, sh paradigm shift there in the chat box, um, not just the task, but what we do with it. So really focusing in on that process. Anyone else? I'll piggyback off what Julie said because I also work in that same district and it has been a strong initiative of ours, the formative learning cycle. <clears throat> but process is the word that also we talked a lot about in the breakout room that I was fortunate enough to be in. And I brought from that with sharing that success criteria, it truly brings the equity to that because every student has an entry level, whether it's your lowest student or your highest student. So they have a gateway into that lesson and then they're just building up on those actionable steps where the success criteria comes into play. You're exactly right, Miss Miss East. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate you bringing out the success criteria because ultimately at the end of the day, that's what we want students to, to take away uh, from our instruction. Anyone else? Um, I'm from Bullet, and we're, of course, really focusing on standards mastery and tracking that mastery. And we, when we started actually looking at every single student and showing their progress toward mastery of each standard, it was glaring some of the students that, and, and mainly I'll admit it was some of our special ed students who weren't quite hitting the mark, And but you saw that pattern. So quickly, uh, my word was ownership. And so we have the ownership, not only for the teachers, but more importantly, of the students. And how do they feel like, what progress do they see toward their progress toward mastery of that standard um, to be sure that it is equitable and all students are included? Absolutely, Amory. And it's so important that we involve students in that process and that they're able to see their progress um, and moving forward. And it sounds like you all are doing a nice job of really looking at the data that you have and the evidence that you've collected to really inform um, that, that formative assessment process. Okay, well, thank you for everyone that shared. And for the sake of time, I'm going to move us along, but I'd like to take a look at the third success criteria and share with you where to access the tools and resources for the balanced assessment section of the model curriculum framework. And so in Appendix D of your model curriculum framework, you will find a link to KDE's balanced assessment modules page. And this is what that page looks like within the balanced um, assessment section of the model curriculum framework. 
Here you will see an overview description of each of the six modules. And when you click on that blue link at the top, it will actually take you here to this page on kystandards.org. So you can actually access it either place. For each of the six balanced assessment professional learning modules, there is an introductory video, which gives you an overview of each module's contents, a PowerPoint presentation, facilitator's guide, and a teacher collaboration activity, which you can then use to help de deepen teacher understanding through practical hands-on applications. The content in the balanced assessment section of the model curriculum framework is purposefully designed around the big ideas in the professional learning modules so that you can then use them both in conjunction with one another in leading professional learning back in your own school or district. So just to let you know where that can be located. And then we know, once again, we've given you a lot of information, so we want to give you an opportunity to kind of empty your brains. So individually, again, on that participant handout for Section 3, we want to give you an opportunity to reflect on your learning around balanced assessment, capturing what is most important for you to remember, as well as some possible next steps for sharing this learning back in your own school or district. So we're going to pause and give you a minute or two to quickly write down. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Jan, and she is going to share some exciting updates on Kentucky's multi-tiered system of supports. Thank you, Carrie. Well, I um, am very excited today as we move into section four to share with you an overview of Kentucky's multi-tiered system of supports. And so what we'd like for you to be able to take away from this section is to be able to identify our six essential components of Kentucky's multi-tiered system of supports, to be able to describe how the KYMTSS framework supports equitable access and opportunity, and to know where to go to access those tools and resources to support implementation of the six essential elements of KYMTSS. Back in 2018 and 2019, um, the KDE began discussion around the need to expand the framework of response to intervention to a more comprehensive multi-tiered system that would address students' academic, behavior, and social-emotional competencies. And this is really um, a way to, um, to just integrate, to look at that whole child. And so out of that work, they identified the need to communicate a common message across the agency, our districts, and schools around MTSS to facilitate our cross-agency collaboration so we're um, aligning our work and to revise our digital guidance and online tools to assist our schools and districts in um, understanding and um, assist them in their implementation of the MTSS framework. So Kentucky's statewide MTSS framework is defined first and foremost as a multi-level prevention system. In this systems level approach, it integrates the instruction, the assessment, and the intervention at just the right intensity to promote our students' academic proficiency, positive behavior, and social emotional wellness. And the foundation of the framework is a strong core instruction with evidence-based instructional practices and resources match the student need. 
And we've talked today a lot from the academic lens, but we really want Kentucky's framework of MTS to be again that whole child lens. And so we're looking at aligning our core instruction to not only our um, grade level standards, but to the, the you know, school-wide behavior expectations and those core social emotional competencies. And that the practices and assessments we use are those that um, address what the student needs at the right time. We want you to think about KYMTS as an overarching framework. It really is a way to organize and integrate those multi-tiered systems and those state, district, and school level initiatives. And we want you to know that the goal of integration is to streamline and bring cohesion to the work so your efforts aren't happening in isolation. So here's some examples of some um, multi-tiered systems that would be integrated and some examples of some initiatives that would be supported under the KYMTSS framework. And this integrated framework is about leveraging and enhancing your existing systems, data and practices, not throwing everything out and starting over. Because we know our districts and schools have one or more of these multi-tiered systems in place and you're at varying levels of implementation. You may be exploring how to fully implement, improve, sustain or integrate your current systems. For example, you might have already established a strong academic response to intervention. You might be implementing positive behavior intervention and supports. And maybe you're exploring or have already begun to initiate those social emotional supports, like social emotional learning, school mental health, trauma informed practices. However, these are often set up as parallel systems with separate teams doing the work, looking at separate data and implementing separate practices. And so the problem becomes that we work in silos. And as new initiatives are added, we add new teams, we add new data, we add new practices, and it can become a little overwhelming. So the advantages or the benefits of an integrated framework is that it allows for more effective, efficient, equitable, and sustainable use of your resources. It aligns to the research that shows that strong interconnectedness of academic and behavior skills. It provides more seamless support through the use of integrated teams, data and practices. And finally, but not least, it really can re reduce that feeling of initiative fatigue or that initiative overload by anchoring everything back to a single cohesive framework. So we have identified six elements as essential to Kentucky's framework for a multi-tiered system of support. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about those in relation to how they're represented on our KYMTSS graphic. The equitable access and opportunity component is depicted surrounding the framework to really depict that intentional commitment to equity across all levels, all components of the system. At the center of the model, we have that familiar triangle to represent that tier delivery of support that's surrounded by academic behavior and social emotional domains to show that those are embedded into every layer of that framework. Surrounding that, you'll see the four other elements, our collaborative, collaborative problem solving teams. Those exist at every level of the system, district, state, teacher, and student level. And we've talked a little bit about teacher level collaborative teams with the PLC um, work that we talked about earlier this morning. The database decision-making is within a comprehensive screening and assessment system. And at tier one, we see those balanced assessment system and we highlighted formative assessment today. But the multi-tier system of support broadens that scope and includes universal screening and progress monitoring. And that's incorporated at every tier across every domain. We also want to talk about um, the importance of evidence-based instructional practices, intervention, and supports. And we talked about those high quality instructional resources. We looked at it through an academic lens, but remember with KYMTSS, we're integrating those um, practices into our academic behavior and social emotional supports. And then it really does encourage that collaboration and those community 
family and school partnerships. So what we want you to think about when you're looking at these, uh, all of these elements is to see them as interconnected and addressing the needs of the whole learner across that continuum of supports. So we have um, designed a new website and we're gonna get on that a little bit later and let you explore. But our purpose is to communicate that common message. Um, so what is KYMTSS? So we have on our website from the navigation pane, you can find information on an overview, why the why behind it, information on our essential elements, and then the resource library has those resources that will aid in understanding and implementation of those essential elements. All of that information can also be accessed from the homepage. And so as you scroll down, you'll come to information like on the six essential elements. And as you click on an icon, it'll bring up a page with information, an overview of that element, why we consider it important, and what are some key features of implementation around the systems, the data, the practices that need to be in place for effective implementation. And each page will have a um, direct link to the resources related to that element. But of course, you can also access those at any time you land on the, the site from that navigation page. So today, um, what I really wanted to do was to highlight one of the resources from the website. Um, and we chose the equitable access and opportunity element. What I'd like you to do in a few minutes, we'll give you time to independently read the brief. It's in the um, participant folder, but I think Thomas is also gonna add it um, to the chat. And your um, graphic organizer is on page three of your participant handout. So as you read over that brief, just think about maybe things that you notice, things that you maybe have questions about, any connections to what you're currently doing in your district, or maybe some next steps, and obviously those connections to promoting student equity. So I'm gonna give you about the next three minutes to just silently read through the brief and jot down your um, thoughts on that graphic organizer. And when we come back, I'd like to ask you to share something that you noted. So I'll give you um, the next three minutes and then we'll come back.
going to ask you to take about 30 more seconds and then we'll come back. Okay, if you'll just pause um, in your reading. And um, what I'd like to do now is just to have you share one idea that resonated with you from your reading. Um, this could be something that you noticed or had a question about or a connection that you made to something that you're doing in your district, um, connection to the student equity. Um, and just if you would unmute um, and share, um, share out, or if you feel more comfortable posting in the chat, Carrie and Misty, I'm having difficulty accessing my chat, so I'm going to have you monitor that for me. Um, but I'm really interested in hearing um, just something that resonated with you. Hi, this is Jessica Duty from um, Covington Independent Public Schools. Um, I really like the component under systems that talked about ongoing professional um, learning opportunities um, in regards to like being culturally responsive. Um, I think that that's something that we all should really be aware of and just making sure that um, teachers have the opportunity to be self reflective in regards to how their own upbringing um, and life experiences could create some potential barriers in the success of our students. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anything else in the work that maybe you guys are doing that is um, so similar to what you see um, in some of these features or any next steps that you may want to take back? And Jan, Julie said in the chat, she talked about reviewing instructional resources reflect all students that representation matters. Um, Absolutely. I think what Jessica was just talking about as well. And then Missy said that multiple sources of data to evaluate and monitor equity and that leadership teams are representative of the students in the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as we get on the slide, you'll have a chance to see some some types of data and maybe some, some sources and some resources that would be useful to you. Okay, we will move on. Um, take you to um, our last success criteria. I really want you to be able to know where you can access those tools and resources um, to help you with the um, building that understanding and um, assisting in the implementation. So we're gonna explore our website. Um, what I'd like to do now, we've, talked, we've looked at that one resource, but I want you to have a chance to see what other resources are available to you and give you time to explore the site. So you'll find the link to the website um, in the chat, kymtss.org. It will be linked to our page on KDE's website, um, April 5th, but it is an active site ready for you to use. Uh, please feel free to take it back and share it with people in your district or region that need access to it. We will be uh, responding to some feedback and making any tweaks um, before it gets published, but it is, it's active, it's ready to go for you to use. So I'd like you to take the next five minutes um, to just explore, look around, see what's on there. Please use your graphic organizer again, just again to, to have places where you can note things that you notice, um, maybe questions that you have. You can even give us feedback on how easy it is to, uh, navigate if it's organized well or how clear we were on our communications. Um, but just take the next five minutes and then we'll come back and I'll ask you to share something that you found.
Take about 30 more seconds and then we'll come back together. Okay, I hope you had um, enough time at least to get a sense of um, kind of how the site's organized and some of the information that is there for you. Um, I'd love to hear just some feedback. So um, if you wouldn't mind in the chat or unmuting, uh, maybe just share something that you noted from your exploration of the site. And I'll ask Misty and Carrie to share from the chat for me. Um, Keita was saying that the crosswalk document is very clear. Lori said that it's very user friendly. Um, again, the crosswalk seems to be very popular. Um, a lot of resources in the resource library to support each element, um, full of resources and tools. Um, so just in a very general sense, people, again, only a five minute search, they really like the resources that they're seeing. Okay, thank you. Well, I hope it's easy for you to access. Um, and please know that the, the advantage of that site is it's, it's very responsive. So as we get feedback and we know what you need to best support you, we'll be able to um, add the resources and things that are, are more aligned to your needs. We wanted that crosswalk. I'm glad some of you discovered that. We really wanted that to portray that the, the things that you'll see under Kentucky's framework are really just integrating things from all those separate ones. And so instead of, again, working in, in silos, we could integrate it all under that one framework. And then Jan, Janice did say that they would love to see a model of MTSS meetings that include aspects of the whole child, like how is time managed to address all of the concerns? And then um, Shauna said that those resources will really support their continuous growth in a systemic approach to MTSS. Okay, great. And I love that idea because um, I, I've just recently come from a district and I know how hard it is in a um, meeting time to, to organize your time and figure out how to, to integrate that work. So that would be um, a good resource and we'll kind of work on trying to get something together for you. And that kind of leads us to kind of where we want to go next um, with KYMTSS. We are developing um, an implementation guide that will be posted to the site. It'll give you a little more in-depth information than we could put in the brief. We also want to make sure that we are aligning the tools and resources to meet your needs. Um, and then we will be developing our, our professional learning uh, opportunities and coaching. And so, one of the things that we would really like to do is as we're moving from this year of, of really probably struggling to figure out how to effectively implement an MTSS framework. And as you're looking ahead, some of the recommendations for moving forward, I'm gonna ground in the core elements of prioritize equity, use the framework to ensure that all students have access to the full range of opportunities and resources at the right moment in their education. And prioritize those most efficient and effective practices those that are supported by research, match to your local needs, and that will have the greatest impact on your students. Continue to use your data to inform your decisions at all levels of the system and continue to invest in those systems to support high quality implementation. Enhance, adjust existing leadership teams to ensure that academic behavior and social emotional competencies are addressed. And as we close out this section, um, just have you take a moment to go back to section four on your handout. Um, just based on your learning, jot down something that you want to remember or take back or a possible next step for your school and district. And you'll also notice a link to a very brief survey. And if you have an opportunity to complete that, it'll give us valuable feedback on the types of resources that you need or the types of professional learning that would be most useful for you. And we'll send that out in an email tomorrow too. So I really would like some feedback there. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to complete your reflection and then we'll turn it over um, to Carrie to, or to Misty, I think, to close out the section.
to wrap up that last thought. And um, Jane, there were some other comments put into the chat that we'll definitely share with you. That was some great, um, the, the website. We know that you are likely a little brain dead right now, suffering from a little overload of information. And one thing we want you to know, if we don't expect people to go back and be able to implement and do everything we talked about today. Uh, we want you to really think about out of the key practices that we talked about, what already aligns with or connects with work that you're doing in your school or district and might be able to support you in taking that next step in improving whatever the key practice might be. So as our kind of closing reflection, we really would love to hear from you. What are some of your key takeaways about the day as a whole, looking at the resources, the key practices we talked about, the importance of supporting standards implementation and its connection to equity and what might be some next steps you want to take around some of these practices back at your school or district. So we again just want to pause. We're going to open up the floor. Feel free to unmute or you can post in the chat maybe some key takeaways that you had from our time together today. And even feedback on the session would be great for us. And again, I, if anyone is posting in the chat, my chat froze. So not sure <laughs> what's going on with chat right now. Oh, um, the resources. Yes, Jim. And I hope you all understand that that is our heart. That is our goal is to support you in the critical work that you are already doing and help you take those next steps. I um, love the format. Very interactive. Thank you, Amy. That was we intentionally try to make it that way for you all. Um, share the information with teachers about formative assessment process, about it's a process and not just a thing. I love that. Mary Beth um, is saying how the resources are user fan or friendly and helping people to refine their processes. And that's really, I think, the one thing we want you all to think about systems and structures and how can we put those in place to really support the work that you're doing. Um, and appreciated the time to talk with others and process that information. You all, I cannot thank you enough from the bottom of my heart for giving of your time because I know it's crazy as many of you are transitioning back to face-to-face. -to -face. Um, and I do want to just let you know that there is an ELA certificate available in your participant folder. I think Thomas is also going to put a link in the chat for the three hours that you gave us today. Um, and again, I just thank you so much for your participation, your engagement in the chat and in the uh, breakout rooms. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Mickey to close us out. And I will say thank you as well. We do have a slide that embeds <clears throat> our email addresses. So please reach out to any of us, again, from the Division of Program Standards um, to assist you, you know, as you are processing these resources and, and even your needs around the resources, please let us know because your feedback truly does help us to um, impact our work and know that we're doing what's best to provide support. So thank you so much. Um, again, we appreciate you and I hope that you have an excellent afternoon. Thank you.